Good evening and welcome to the very first event in our series, The Art of the Maker. Uh, tonight, we're exploring the art school tradition uh, in the 21st century. My name is Karina Perriman and I'm Professor of Colour, Design and Print and Director for the Centre for Fine Print Research in the School of Art and Design. And I will be your chair for this evening. Um, we'll be holding a roundtable discussion for about an hour. Please do drop questions into the chat and I will keep my eye on this and there will be an opportunity to do a, a, a Q&A as well. Um, at the moment, uh, we're in presentation mode, so you should um, only be able to see myself and my colleagues, my speakers. Um, and um, so, but after the discussion around 6.15, we will return to the auditorium where you, um, you, where you came in, which is all the, the chairs and then the, 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 the tools. Um, please, please feel free to stay and talk to colleagues and the platform will remain open until about quarter to seven. Um, if you're not familiar with Remo, um, what happens is that you're on tables of six and each black dot represents a seat. So you can remain on your table you can talk to the people on your table. Um, to do this, you need to uncheck the camera off and the mic off icons at the bottom of your screen. And if everyone does the same, you'll be able to see the other people on your table. But don't worry if you don't want to. If you want to table hop um, or uh, find a spare seat on another table or simply just wish to move, double click on a table you want to wish you wish to move to and you'll be transported to a, another table if there is a space. You can also go up floors as well. Um, so if you click on uh, on the left hand side, there's a one, two and three, which enables you to go up uh, onto a different floor. And the message will say you're about to take the elevator to go to another floor in this space. Are you sure? It feels quite weird and it feels a bit like time trouble, but please do um, go around the uh, and have a look. Um, please also note that the, the Remo conference will unceremoniously kick you out. So please do say your goodbyes quickly when, the, uh, when you have the warning. So I am delighted to introduce you to my panel for tonight. Um, hopefully, have we got all our panel members? Christine, are you here? Great, wonderful. Um, so yes. Um, uh, Steve Hoskins is Professor of Fine Print and uh, founder for the Centre for Fine Print Research. He's a practising printmaker, he's currently preparing for an online exhibition of his work in Hong Kong and has published extensively on both 3D printing and the history of print. Jack Butler is Head of School of Art and Design and Associate Professor at UE Bristol. She's a member of the Advisory Board for On the Image, an international arts and humanities network trustee for Open Eye Photography Gallery in Liverpool, and a founding member and joint coordinator of the Family Ties Network, a research group of writers, artists, and filmmakers exploring the theme of space, place, and the family that host annual events around the, the UK. Jacqueline continues to exhibit and write as an interdisciplinary artist. Teresa Dillon is professor of City Futures, um, she's based at the Pervasive Media Studio at the Watershed in Bristol and UWE. And she's, um, also of many, of, she's a woman of many talents, um, but she's also um, the lead of the Research Manifesto, which um, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, later on. Um, and Christine Howes is a trustee and artist printmaker from Spike Print Studio. Uh, she has a, a BA and an MA in graphic design from Central School of Art and worked as a book illustrator for many years in London, Australia. So welcome to you all. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, at the end of this day. Um, my, uh, this, as I said, is the beginning of a, of a series and the title of this series is, is stolen from a book by Peter Dormer, who uh, as a student and a, uh, and a practitioner had a pr profound effect on my practice as a studio, as a, as a student working in studios. Um, and he presented this kind of really novel idea that making and materials and processes were intertwined and provide mutual benefits. And as a printmaker, my practice was all about process and making, and it seemed obvious to me, but maybe not to others. 
Tonight, this digital round um, table will explore the role of the practitioner and the studio in the 21st century. And we're constantly reminded that the so-called neatly packaged creative industries presents a huge income of tens of billions of pounds for the UK. Pre-COVID, the art and design sector was a thriving community and so-called creatives, as we know, are resilient at finding practical solutions. But this, of course, comes at a cost. Skills, opportunities, places to work are constantly being eroded. And even more so over this last year where so many organisations have struggled and folded. This is yet to be properly studied and time will tell of the, the long term impact. But what I'd like to do tonight is to explore how we educate and train people to become robust practitioners and thinkers how to maintain their work through networking and communities of practice. And of course, the, that foundation, the very foundation of art and design as a good education and that opportunity to access and that as opportunities to access for study. So how has this changed? Is there a studio uh, tradition? Is that a rosy glow of the so-called artist in the studio? Was there more time or opportunity in the past or is this kind of just a, a, a bunch of fiction so what i'd like to do is to explore what are the changes that have taken place over the last 30 years since 1992 when polytechnics became universities and where we are today um, and that and the commercial impact um, as as well so steve i'd like to turn to you first um, and, and I wonder if you could talk about those, that sort of notion of the art school tradition pre-92 and what was that kind of impact of, of the Further and Higher Education Act of, of 1992? Thank you, Karina. Um, yeah, I first attended art school for, for my sins 47 years ago. So I kind of have a long history of, of what's going on. And I'm really gonna start with the 1970s, but I think you need a little bit of context. So. Post-war, the UK had a comprehensive set of art schools. Uh, a few university courses such as Newcastle, Reading and Exeter, and the London schools were a separate entity. But the regional schools were very much seen for practical training, for commercial art. They had an intermediate diploma in design and a solid basic training course, which led to the more specialised national NDD which offered not only fine art, but commercial art, dressmaking and other practical skills. But there were calls to formalise the system, which in the 1960s led to the um, a degree equivalent called the DIP-AD, which was formulated through a report by Sir William Coldstream in 1960. And this, the DIP-AD consisted of one year foundation course and a three year diploma in art and design, which was when we first saw the diploma, the foundation and the three year diploma. Um, the award was only given in four areas, textiles and fashion, three dimensional design, graphic design and fine art. I'm afraid we're going to get a few figures coming up soon. You were required to have five O levels, three of which had to be academic. An entry was a portfolio of artwork. However, exceptional circumstances could be applied for talented students if they had a good portfolio, but not the required qualifications. Now, the foundation course which came at that time was hugely influenced by the teaching of Harry Thurbron at Leeds and Victor Passmore and Richard Hamilton at Newcastle. And it was based on Bauhaus principles and it established visual literacy, use of colour and establishment of form and construction of space, which was the first time we've moved away from the really traditional art school teaching. Uh, once it was in place, as an aside, it was discovered in 1972 by sampling graphic design students over seven years that the students with the highest qualifications at O and A level obtained the worst final qualifications. By the late 60s and early 70s, art schools now had a degree equivalence and began to be amalgamated into the polytechnics. In 1974, the DPAD became a degree validated by the Council for National Academic Awards, who validated the polytechnics. So, for example, the West of England School of Art became part of Bristol Polytechnic. And it's at this point that the art schools also became known as the accessible alternative to university. And I think that's where the notion of studio comes in. They offered a practically orientated craft and aesthetic education. An art school had become a home for a wide range of creative talents, building upon 
a strong base for the UK's creative standing in the world. And, and there are hundreds of examples of people who went to art school that went on to become musicians and writers. But until 1992, art schools, even with the polytechnics, retained a fair degree of autonomy. You applied to a foundation course at your local institution and then a degree course through Art and Design's admission registry, ADAR. Uh, you applied with marching portfolio new by the end of May if you had a definite place. But after 1992 and the Further and Higher and Education Act, everything changed. The polytechnics became universities, so ADAR was scrapped, and applications went through UCAS, the University and College Administration System. Now, I think two primary events occurred from this change. First, it became possible to gain direct entry from art school, from school to art school, without completing a foundation course. And secondary, the increase in numbers going to the university and art school increased exponentially. Now, here's where the figures come in. More people going to first degree in 90, 2017 than the total attendance at university as a whole in 1980. Secondly, higher education numbers increased from 51,000 attending degree courses in the 70s to 584,000 studying degree courses in 2017. Mind you, this statistical comparison that does not include polytechnic degrees. So even so, the increase is five or six times greater than it was in the 70s. So to give you a clear idea of those numbers, Bristol UE's Bower Ashton campus was built in 1967 to hold a maximum of 600 students. It now has over 3,000. Brighton College of Art in 1970 had 635 students on its course. And the average staff student ratio when I studied at West Surrey College of Art um, under BIA Honours course was four students to one member of staff, compared with today 17 plus students to one member of staff. Another way of viewing it is by my reckoning, 3,800 people were accepted on degree courses in art and design in 1970. But the best accurate figures I can find are from 1991. The art and designs registry had 6,900 acceptances for the first year, but by 1996 that had led to 9,000 odd, and by 2017, 52,000 registered for the first year of a creative art and design degree. So the results of all this are obviously a radical change um, in the system. First, the academization of the art school, second, a modular approach to teaching, and third, the reduced time and increased numbers for teaching practical skills. In the 70s, when I was taught, it was not uncommon to spend a month, that's five days a week, on a single drawing in the life room as part of drawing tuition. I'm not advocating everybody should do this, but it exemplifies that deeper approach to learning that's possible in the current environment, not possible in the current environment. I was also taught lettering, perspective, colour theory, and how to prepare and stretch a canvas, and how to stretch a sheet of paper and the importance and reasons for best quality tools. I, for example, still have my Kolonsky sable brushes I bought well over 40 years ago. My undergraduate study was three years of gentle process of learning. After two terms of painting, sculpture and printmaking, I studied printmaking as my main subject and silversmithing as a subsidiary. After undergraduate, I spent a year working as a commercial screen printer and then I moved to the Royal College of Art in 1978, where I studied for a further three years of sole printmaking. Thus, my years as a student amounted to seven years. The academisation hadn't begun to buy. And whilst Coldstream stated that 15% of the curriculum should be about art history and general studies, this was only advisory. And when I studied in the 70s, the degree show accounted for 85% of your final mark. At that time, you studied mainly Western art history and had to complete six short essays for your final degree. Now the art school is measured by tariff points you've gained before you apply. An applicant has to reach the double barrier of academic study and art, though I admit it's still possible to do a one-year foundation course and regain the required tariff points. The modular structure introduced in the 90s is still in place, though understandable with the increased number and pressure that staff are under. It is my belief a process not conducive to practical teaching and learning. It has led to a short term culture where work is made to a specific time style and greatly reduces the, reduces the importance of a final degree show. Whilst good arguments can be made for these changes, I believe it's a further reduction of the importance of learning for personal understanding. 
a process much more preferable than the practice of learning to an outcome. From the standpoint, the opposite standpoint, as an academic, or from the teacher's perspective, when I first taught in the early 80s, and this is the studio thing, it was possible to live as a lecturer on two days a week teaching and have three days in the studio. By the 90s, it was necessary to teach five days a week to make ends meet. It was also possible to teach across disciplines. So to give you an example, in the early 90s, I taught foundation on a Monday in Stourbridge, BA graphics on a Tuesday in Bath, Fine Art at UE on a Wednesday, Adult Education Printmaking at Queen's Road, Bristol on a Thursday, and Illustration at Harrow on a Friday. The number of students changed rapidly. When I started teaching at UE in the early 80s, I had six students to teach printmaking and four when I taught at Bath. By the time I finished as an itinerant lecturer in the early 90s, I was teaching groups of up to 30. Most of the part-time teaching staff these days are either fractional contracts or run a mix of jobs to make ends meet. And I'll just finish on the positives. More students than ever study art and design, according to Universities UK. It is also possible to argue the integration of art and design into the university system has given art schools a permanence that it didn't have before. And UE still remains an art, active drawing. Students can still do life drawing and students still make. And it's clear if you talk to printmaking, ex-printmaking students, that studios like Artichoke and London Print Studio say that UE students know how to print, unlike other recent graduates from other art schools. So that's my quick yeah. 10 minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. I think it gives a really kind of interesting picture as you know of, of that um of that trajectory of the last 30, 40 years. And um and um Jack, I just wondered if you wanted to, to kind of, from, from your point of view of how um, today uh, you, you know, regularly represent the art and design at University Alliance as part of the National Higher Education and Art and Design Group. You've recently attended the Council for Higher Education at TEE. What, which is, uh, which is a, a really important council for helping to shape higher education in, in art and design policy so i'm sure you you come with with very fresh insights so what do you think is it is it good news or bad news um you know the the, the universities have such multiple demands um you know and on how they operate today and and i noticed someone in in the chat um uh is the threat of the art school by the universities themselves if management don't have an art and design background can this make hard for them to understand both the nature of the art schools <laughs> you know and i think that's a really important and 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 uh, you know um potent question thank you rachel so how do we make sure that the art of you know the art of making how we make is still firmly rooted in in teaching art uh, through design and craft Uh, thank you for that question, actually. I really like that one. It made me laugh. Um, I, I think that um, from a, a personal perspective, I think it is actually really important that um, within management, particularly around practice-based learning, that to have a connectivity, it may not be specific to art and design, but understand the importance of uh, uh, practice and making in how we develop our thinking, even if that is as a writer. So, uh, you know, I think that um, that that is a very important thing. And I think that's what's important with uh, the, the two groups that I'm involved with, University Alliance and CHEED, is that um, in both cases, these are uh, groups that have um, experts in art and design. We've cut our teeth in it. We've worked our way through it. And we've uh, taken the sticky old pole up into arts management. And I would uh, call people out and say that's where, where we really need to encourage and nurture new talent because um, there are less people moving into to art and design management um, because they feel they'll lose their practice. So there's a tendency to look at, to maintain practice, let's look towards research routes. So this is my call out really to say that it's incredibly important because I think we do have a voice. I think that um, what's coming out at the moment in, in the groups that I'm working with is that we are less in competition and more working together because there are real dangers ahead. 
you know, we, we've been deemed as not value for money um, because of the way that that value is measured. Um, you know, how many students within a limited period, uh, 12 to 18 months, can really be earning higher, you know, high figures. Um, but what has happened with COVID? I'm incredibly optimistic because what COVID did was actually show the value we have in many different ways. And I think particularly looking at um, uh, health and well-being is really important. And, and the, the, the impact that we have um, in all aspects of community uh, life of the city. So I think there's really good news there. Um, I think that one of the biggest assets that everyone has proven they have is resilience, both staff and students, the ability to move and change at very short notice, uh, to, to be agile to some really challenging situations. So I think we've actually proven ourselves really well to, to, uh, to government. Um, but there's always going to be more to do. We're expensive um, and we do have to understand that we need to be able to translate the things that people in this room will understand. We need to translate those values because it's not easily understood. Um, I, I really like this sort of discussion around what we mean by the, this sort of sense of the importance of the art of making. And, you know, Karina, you asked about it um, as uh, how do we kind of maintain it. I, th I think really it's also about given the change, how it is going to be very different. And we need to ensure that we are steering that ship and that we are taking advantage of those changes. Um, a lot of the discussions, I went to a fantastic uh, talk yesterday at Cheeds uh, by Vicky Gunn, who I've actually invited to come and talk to um, my team in a couple of weeks. We, we arranged it quite a while ago but what was really interesting was a discussion about what we mean by studio and what the studio has been during COVID and what it can be in the in the future um, so that there is and there's interesting discussions when you talk to students about the things that we all know we miss which is the community um, those informal discussions that we have um, that kind of the nuances of of just walking through a space uh, I think the those uh, unexpected conversations, they all input into how we make and, and think. Um, so that at a very local level, that peer learning and co-learning with tutors, I think, has been very Im highly impactful. But there are things around community that are really interesting in that we are inviting global communities in. So it's so easy to actually invite someone in to run a masterclass, to uh, do a crit. So I think it's that thing of uh, the, the students being very used to people from the outside coming in. And I think that um, I, I was asked what my vision for the art school was uh, by, by um, the, the dean recently. And I said it was about a glass house that we protect and nurture talent but we also are very visible and seen and people feel they can come in and be and work with us. And I think these are things that are being readily discussed. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other things that come into this narrative around um, movements like Black Lives Matter. Um, and that really has driven things, maybe the way we really want them to be, the fa you know, a faster shift into not just do we have diverse communities, but are our programmes fit for purpose? Do they allow people the access that they, they deserve? Um, because we have run with a three-year degree for quite some time now. So there is an opportunity for a lot of change, things like people stepping on and off of um, degree courses, uh, see, short courses being much more important as a way in. So I think there's lots of... Re I'm very optimistic about what this studio community could be but but we would have to look at studio being something quite different we've got some fantastic work that's been done um, by staff and students to really challenge um the this what a virtual studio is virtual there's the institutional and actually recently some students were talking about working within domestic environments and the domestic environment get given them an opportunity to be more autonomous and actually to prepare for what is ahead of them. Because unfortunately, we don't all become artists and have great studios when we leave. We need to learn how to manage 
and be resilient. So all of these discussions are actually feeding an awful lot of the decisions that as heads we want to make to ensure that we are maximizing the estates we have and we're doing we're doing much more with it. Um, but I think we've also got to be careful that because we do things very well, we're very, I think we're, because we're creatives, so we're very adaptable, that, um, that we protect our estates and we tell that narrative about, yes, we're using it differently, but that doesn't necessarily mean we need less. Because I think that, you know, if you look, someone doing, um, going around with their clipboard, they really are going to look at how we work with space. But I think that was happening for a long time before. And in some ways, I think we're much more prepared for that for the, the future. Um, I did want to touch just slightly on this. I think, uh, Steve, when you were you were talking about this sort of process of, of making, I think what was fantastic through um, COVID was because a lot of that high end kit was taken away because students had to work quite quickly and change they really started to value process much more than product, I, I think. And that has come from discussions from students and colleagues across the country have said this is very much the same narratives they're having. Um, and there was a, a technician from RCA, uh, an event yesterday, who really talked about that, about how we also can give us an opportunities to share some of the expert spaces we have. Um, so I think that we can work better um, and our students really, really feel a sense of the importance of taking those steps, both using very, what I would call sort of primitive techniques and technologies alongside those more advanced. Um, I was never someone that was into analog digital um, um, competitions. Uh, I think there's something very important about actually students learning really traditional and historic um, process of making, not because I think we should be holding on to something, but I certainly know from my own experience working with new technologies that if I hadn't learned that tradition, I, I learned my tradition in uh, film edit suites and dark rooms, that I could never have applied the way I work with new technology. So I think that sort of connection to um, how we work with the material and the immaterial and how actually they're very close, much closer to one another than some people assume. And these are all things that have come to the fore because of uh, what has happened recently. But we just need to make sure that we are harnessing them and making them do the things we know need to happen to give our students a much better um, experience. Um, I mean, I could go on for far too long, so I, I don't want to touch upon too many things, but. I do think the studio culture and what we mean by studio is probably one of the biggest conversations that is happening now and it is highly impactful in how our future estates will be designed. Yeah, I think what that that the whole balance between the kind of the virtual studio and being much more flexible and and amorphous and and I think you know what you you're saying about resilience is a is a really crucial um you know aspect of how we uh you know how we uh, how we evolve as practitioners but also how we undertake research and how we undertake practice um and um as a university uh, we've nearly just undertaken our national review of of research in universities which is is called uh, research excellent framework where all subjects um uh, and areas are, are compared across the uk and it's very much a metric base um, on outcomes and and impact and art and design is one of these and i i always feel that it's a rather kind of curious balance between um you know sort of metric and and the kind of the exploration is exactly what you're saying jack of um of of process and materials and and making um, but Teresa, um, has, when when you started a, a, as professor, um, you um, introduced this idea of a, a, a research manifesto, you know, coming together through communities of practice, and and I thought that was a very potent way, and exactly what what Jack was saying about how do we share knowledge, um, how do we share spaces, how do we um, how do we communicate with each other, and that obviously is 
um, been tested over the last over the last year. So, um, what are your thoughts about that re that relationship between research and art and design practice, and and how have you come to it, and what have you explored? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Karina, for that opening question. Um, I guess when I first kind of came to UE, I used the the sort of approach of setting up a series of workshops to have a conversation collectively around what are the the values that we might share research and in some ways at uh, time you know uh, in the late 90s and me kill with um Catherine Hannon was out there with the the riot girl manifesto and you know Donna Haraway's cyborg manifesto had sort of you know, I kind of grew up with the internet in a sense. And so these kind of notions of sort of setting a tone or a value system through which the community um, can adhere to, or at least perhaps um, have on our backs in a sense, they're not, they're not necessarily a set of hardcore rules or structures, but they enable us to kind of create some sort of value system in a way. And I was also quite influenced by Wenger and um, Jean Lave and Ichen Wenger's communities of practice model um, coming coming there from the direction of, you know, educational psychology and that sort of perspective in a way which speaks to the socialization process of participation and how one comes from the outside and the periphery to become into the, into the center and kind of have various different ways in which levels of participation can emerge within a community. Um, so in a sense, the, the manifesto was a, as a, was a mechanism to have a kind of a conversation which, um, I didn't particularly realize was one that we hadn't had necessarily before within the school. And I think that, you know, perhaps as a naive newcomer, I, you know, had an opportunity, accidentally had an opportunity through which we could sort of galvanize together and um, without potential pressures there from it coming from like above or it coming from a particularly marketing ploy or et cetera. And, and people responded to that in a sense. And I think it was a slightly, it, it, in that respect, it was a slightly gentle process, which then generated in a very generative way with colleagues, a conversation about what it does mean to kind of work together in a sense. And, you know, hooking back into Steve's, you know, history that he spoke towards as well, or spoke to, you know, with the, some of the early art schools um, that he mentioned in the UK being influenced by the Bauhaus tradition. I spent a lot of time and spend a lot of time in Germany. So, you know, those traditions of manifestos, um, the Black Mountain College manifesto as well, the kind of the positioning of an interdisciplinary inquiry, which really um, is central to those um, very, very influential schools and manifestos that were associated with thinking about hybrid interdisciplinary knowledge forms, situated often in post-war kind of conditions, but specifically looking at like how we can, gar you know, garner and support and facilitate collaboration in a sense and particularly with the Bauhaus um, manifesto in a sense looking towards that question of craft um, personship let's say and not making this big distinction between the noble artist and the craft maker and I think this was one of the things that sort of resonated in the research manifesto conversations that we had at UWE which actually brought together for almost uh, I don't want to say the first time but really really sure that all of our technical staff research roles in that box were in that kind of and again led to some very generative outputs um, within that and I think that's I think students respond very well when actually they can sort of see that there's a working set of principles and values that a school kind of has and I, I'm, I'm sort of observing this in other universe um, art schools at the moment both on the continent of Europe in a sense who are also putting forward 
they may not call it a manifesto, it might be a declaration, but it's a kind of a value system in a sense, because I think that art schools are having to buffer themselves in a sense. I mean, you know, Jack spoke there about the challenges in the sense that we're not considered as value for money. But if we have a set of sort of principles and statements that we can sort of um, support each other in these moments, I think it's it's kind of quite kind of quite interesting. And and also within that, you know, going back to what Steve was sort of saying about the length of time that it takes one to be proficient in one's profession, art profession. I think that was the other thing that really emerged from those conversations within the, the research um, manifesto workshops was actually acknowledging when you listen to your to your your colleagues within the school how long it has taken them to 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 reach their status how long it has it has taken them for to be masters of their craft you know we have amazing crafts people at in ue 30 20 40 years you know and and you know I can feel that I know that myself. I come from a background in theatre and performance. I work with sight and place and technology, and it takes years to become, you know, not not even a, like to even master your own game. I don't know if you ever master. You're always sort of playing. You're always opening it up and questioning it. And um and so I think then you know when we when we where does this come you know where does this intersect where does a, where does a conversation around having a manifesto intersect with the questions of the traditional art school and the contemporary studio practice i i'm really keen to advocate almost a slow studio movement in a sense and that slow studio stu, studio movement sure it may come from someone's kitchen sink at one point or it may be in a hybrid manifestation or it may be the need to have a very large empty space, you know, as Kit Polson, you know, was speaking when we were hosting those workshops as well, you know, just having the, the, the empty cube to play. And, you know, that that's both a, manif a physical manifestation. And again, the Bauhaus Manifesto emphasized that as well. The building was a crucial, the physical space was a crucial entity in thinking how you can gather people in the first place. So I think we, we have to resist you know, losing space in a sense, because space is what enables us to gather together and form community in coherent ways. And those spaces, whether they are now in this blended form of education that we speak to, we still have to have, you know, the classic, I'm going to meet you in a room and I'm going to sweat it out for a few hours and it's going to be painful, but it's going to take time and you're going to learn something in the process of the tact and the touch and the you know the somatic of of what we kind of do because otherwise i think that if we start to get ourselves into a situation where everything is is gone virtual or it's pushed out into the into the kitchen or the bedroom in a sense that kind of capacity really to work at certain levels is not going to be fully understood you know so um so i guess you know without going on to a big kind of ramble about what i mean by studio movement we should be able to think through these new challenges of what where the studio might reside now in our in our educational practice but be be very coherent about what what we need to kind of retain because of the the the, the, the deep time that it takes for one to manifest an art practice and to hold that because it is a life it is a lifetime it's a, to, to be an artist it requires you to understand what it is to have a sustainable practice and and that's 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 what we, we need to be supporting our students to understand it's not a flash in the pan moment actually it's it's an intellectual inquiry that leads you through your whole life and can lead you through your whole life but can be sustained in different ways. So how do we prepare our students for that? Um, and I think, you know, this is where reaching into the history of those own ones, they can help to sort of um, orientate some of those sensibilities. A passive. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, thank you, Teresa. I'm, I'm just going to follow up um, by um, uh, from a, in the chat, uh, Rachel Holden. Um, she says, I really like what Teresa is saying. Having something like a manifesto is a tool for communication for the students, tutors and the wider community. We have to educate the wider community and invite them because we can't really work without them. 
She also says the physical arts school is a haven for students. We need a playground. We can't lose space. And art isn't just about learning skills. It's a social and intellectual development too. And I think what you're saying, you know, I, I, I agree entirely, Teresa, about that space is is where it is crucial um i mean we're you know we are in a, this virtual space but we need to have that kind of engagement which is you know the, the physical and, and tangible and 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 as craft makers designers we we need to have that um that that kind of push uh, against um through kind of material and through process jack Sorry, I just can't resist it uh, because, because I, I, I agree and I don't agree because I think uh, Rachel's comment, I, I partially agree. But the thing that is great when you are pushed out of studio as well is, I mean, to educate a wider community, also to be educated by. And I think that, uh, yes, we do need to preserve our, our the spaces, but um, we, we need to be responsive to how we might work differently. And, and I, I think that there are things that we should be doing most definitely and we need to hold on to but um we need to be careful that we're not just talking at people rather than talking with them because i think that that will give us a much better position to to argue the best way to work with space yeah and and space as we know is a is a very contested area and but and and you know is is a haven for uh, for students during their you know their precious three to four years and that you know is 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 a is is why you know we 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 come to art school to engage to 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 be part of that network but what happens after art school what happens to the students as they become professionals as they as they kind of move into the workplace um, and they you know they're they're on their own um christine with with your experience of, of of spike print studios what's been your experience and the impact of of, of lockdowns how do you see artists um working and being creative in diff in different ways well um i'm glad you've asked me that question um corina it, it is a fantastic place to print spike print studio and uh we have many young people come in to work in that space and that is a great um, kind of fertilization on on each side and i can't say that things have not been very difficult in the past year they have and i will come on to that because um uh, we have to be realistic about trying to keep um, a commercial space like spike print studio afloat um, but first of all i'm going to briefly talk a little bit about myself because after um, Steve has spoken it made me reflect upon a fantastic art education that I had myself you know and I was going to art college in the 1970s and I did do a foundation and then a graphic design degree and we went through modules of fantastic subject matter like um, lettering you know we learned about letter forms from a guy who designed a typeface for letter set uh, we did proper typography where we set type in lead we we had photography and ph photographic studios we had animation class and we do these kind of six week blocks of learning moving through these different studio spaces and having a very enriching um, degree so I feel I was lucky and I feel also that in those days and possibly Steve as well as myself we're supported by grants and that is something that's completely you know taken away today so he had seven years uh, I had five and a half years supported financially by the state and you know how wonderful if that could happen to some students these days um, we learned about the history of design, uh, which was fantastic. Um, and I went on then to be a book illustrator in publishing in London and had to go freelance, which is a big shock for any young person uh, touting their portfolio around a London publishing house, you know, scary moment. But that's just a brief um, outline of my beginnings. Um, I came to Spike Print Studio 
uh, in my 50s where I'd had a career as an illustrator and I'd, I had really enjoyed that part of my life. But reconnecting with a space like Spike Print Studio was amazing to me. It was like going back to art college, you know. There were all these studios full of uh, creative people, fantastic equipment and um, advice, you know, that you could get and support. And I, be I, I began to value Spike Print Studio as a, an institution. And uh, after a number of years, there came a time where we as an entity felt vulnerable in the building. And we felt we didn't really want to be um, taken over by the whole building of Spike Island. It wasn't appropriate for us. So um, it, it made me step up to the mark and become a member of the board of trustees. Uh, because I felt that I didn't want to lose the space. I didn't want to lose how the space felt. And um, in, in becoming a member of the board, it, it's made me more aware of the difficulties of running the studio, um, where our money comes from, and, and how we reach out into the community, and how we reach out to young people. And so um, the print studio has fantastic links to the community and to UE, as most of you know, and carries on these fabulous programs of outreach. Um, just for example, you know, we, um, we run uh, workshops one per month for um, homeless people via um, a charity and we are subsidized occasionally by these links. Uh, Rising Arts Agency has funded a place for a young person between the age of 16 and 30 to uh, undertake a course in textile printmaking. Um, we also have um, some support from the Quartet Community Foundation. And throughout COVID, those things have become more and more important to us. Uh, we have a fabulous studio director whom I'm uh, representing today, who's just worked tirelessly to keep the whole place afloat. So we have had some grants um, from a quartet. Uh, we've also had a couple of small grants from Bristol City Council. Um, these are enabling us to stay afloat, um, plus the response of our membership. Now, we have well, we had quite a large membership, um, over 150 members in various levels of uh, membership, you know, full-time, part-time. And uh, throughout the COVID crisis, we've lost a third of our membership. And I think that must have been the situation for the London Print Studio and other places that can't keep going because you can't always ask your members to cough up every month for a facility that they cannot come to, they cannot print, they cannot attend. And their own jobs and part-time financial support is in jeopardy themselves, you know. So that has been very challenging. Um, but uh, our courses did go online. And uh, when we were allowed to have students in, we divided the courses into two. And we had, for example, five students in our studio and five students working at home. And then the following week, we had the other five come in and do the course physically. And then again in January, we had to close down again and things went totally online. And you can imagine that there's a huge responsibility for the studio and the trustees and all the staff to close, reopen with regulations, because you've all probably gone through that yourselves with UE, et cetera. And um, now we're slightly dependent upon reopening in April again. And uh, of course, that's a total unknown because nobody really does know if we'll be able to have physical people in studios by then. Um, so things, still happening online at the moment. Um, so
also, uh, what were the other things? Oh yeah. So in the studio, we've had some some professional members print limited, uh, small limited edition prints to raise funds for the studio. Um, we've arranged some talks online. So we have a person from the VNA uh, coming to give a lecture. Um, we have a book binding course online again, and I think this um, uh, resonates with something um, Jack, Jack said or Teresa about being able to have tutors from Australia give a workshop. You know, how amazing is that? Because we can communicate long distance and connect with very creative people in Japan or China or, you know, in those ways. And that is actually something that is opening up due to all this wonderful technology. Um, going back to um, Spike Print Studio, another way that they have managed is to have various members of staff on furlough. We have a very small staff, but most of them have been on furlough um, some of the time or part part-time furlough and other part-time in the office. But the amount of work that's necessary to keep the studio afloat hasn't actually decreased. It's probably increased. So, you know, it, you can't ask your furlough staff to work, but there's still masses of work to do. And um, so that is a challenge going forwards. Um, another project that um, we, we set up via the uh, sponsored by the Community um, Foundation at Quartet was to provide some print packs for people who couldn't actually physically come into the studio. These were uh, young people uh, between the age of 16 and 30, um, supported by Quartet Community Foundation. And they were sent these packs to take home and print at home with the aid of a, a video uh, video training and telling them, you know, what to do. And uh, we ha I haven't seen many of the results yet, but I'm really looking forward to seeing <laughs> what ways people are printing from their homes and ways that they can connect all together and give feedback to the studio. Um, we have had some rent reduction from Spike Island, for which we're really, really grateful. Um, that has varied, you know, 50% at times, 25% at other times, and fantastically has helped us to stay afloat. But it, we're in a difficult position now, and going forwards, who knows, but we are still going, you know, and that is marvellous. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who's helped. I think the your your reference to the kind of the online uh, teaching and those kind of sending out of packs and being able yeah. to kind of expand uh, in you know internationally has yes. has really kind of uh, sort of aided in that kind of uh, dem demographic um, yes. and, and democracy uh, yes. and and you know kind of finding about kind of new ways of of, of communication and and connecting and I think Absolutely. that's mm -hmm. a that's a really important aspect through. You know, kind of yeah. reading that through online platforms. Yeah. yeah. So, so one last um, one last thing I'd like to say, Karina, about this project with Peter Blake was um, I found it inspiring because during my long career in art, which I'm I feel very fortunate to have had, um, I've tried many kinds of printmaking myself. So I did an etching course with Stephen, who spoke earlier, <laughs> and. Um, I've done courses in um, lino cut, wood cut, wood engraving, Japanese wood cut, and I've really enjoyed learning about all the different ways of printmaking. And I know there's many, many more to learn. And I don't see it as a clashing at all with um, people who print uh, via a computer or via photography, because it's all a skill which can be acquired and learned and valued. And we can import skills from one to another from all of those places. You know, they can, they can overlap. Um, I did once see a student at um, Spike Print Studio convert her print to a woodcut 
by a photographing a piece of wood grain. And um, I was worried that she failed to realize that when you cut a piece of wood with a chisel, you make a totally different mark. <laughs> And you can't just cut a smooth outline, you know, or it doesn't come out like that. And I think that's the value that these um, craft-based printmaking skills can bring into the um, computer age and the age of digital printmaking and photography. They've all got their um, their different feelings, haven't they? All these yeah, prints. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, um, Ryan is um, and uh, is asking about how he says. I wonder how we can improve the value of, of making processes, uh, recognizing skills within the module, and more importantly, part of that assessment criteria. Or is or is this needed, Jack? What do you think? Um. I'd like to know what, what the modules were. I mean, I'm, I'm someone, I'm very old school in the way that um, I believe that we should just have one big module. <laughs> I've always been a believer of a, a you know, a holistic approach uh, rather than unpicking, you know, unpicking the bones because someone that really does do fantastic uh, 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 craft is someone that also understands the importance of the idea, you know, so there's not a disconnection. It's not like a, it's not a tick box. And I think that's a real problem when we talk about craft, we talk about it at quite a basic level of acquiring a skill. Yeah. And I think it's much, much more than that. I would like to come in on Christy. I was really touched by some of those comments, Christine. It's so, um, I really understand the uh, challenges that you've gone through and all I would say as well I mean it's a lot of response I like when people get angry about let's like, save our art school but the reality for me as well is places like uh, Spike Print I worked at DCA uh, Print Studio as an artist in residence and I was absolutely astounded by the work they were doing to be much more inclusive and bringing people in to see that art is relevant to their lives and to their futures and I think those sort of connections that we make with some of our partners in the city are ways that we can have people coming into our art school. Because I'm sorry to say I'm not really that convinced that our art schools are as great as we think they are because they're very exclusive. Mm. Um, so, Christina, I was really, uh, it's in our, our interest, not only for our students becoming graduates, for us to have really interesting people coming in and working so differently and I think places like your place we, we need to support you and, and look at how we can support one another. Uh, Colm uh, uh, uses the, the, the notion of the marketization of education um, which has kind of dictated the curriculum and the values placed on, on post-graduation so how do we combat that? How do we retain the academic art and design inquiry? Steve? Quite interesting because I think the industrial mea culpa for, for both. I, I've been a complete person who's been academized by an artist being in academia, and I'm somebody who's been completely industrialized by somebody being in academia. So, so mea culpa on my part. But I think we mustn't lose sight of the fact that education's for knowledge, and somehow you know you need to gain knowledge, and skill is part of that gaining of knowledge, and. And I don't think you can separate out skill, knowledge and learning for industry from that. I mean, I've always managed, when we, as you know, Karina, we've been very successful in working with industry because we understand the fundamentals of the processes we deal with. And if you understand that, you know, a newspaper is printed by lithography these days and originally it was printed from a chunk of limestone, you can work out how the machine works. So though new technologies come in and we, pick them up all the time if you understand the fundamentals of process and you're taught the fundamentals of process and I think that's a quality thing as well as I was trying to say about my paintbrushes that you know I've had one here for over 40 years and it cost me about two quid in the 1980s but it's still good and so it was very cheap to buy because somebody explained to me why it was worth buying a really good quality brush in the first place and why it was worth my time to have a good sheet of paper. And I think we've lost a little bit of that gaining of knowledge and understanding that's the fundamental rather than the stuff that goes around it. I don't know if that explains very well what I mean. Yeah, 
uh, someone, um, Rachel has also talked about the idea, um, William Morris urged us to understand the nature of how our, uh, of our tools and process. So, you know, the, the to tools are fundamental uh, to, to the making. Teresa, you wanted to, to say something. Yeah, just to kind of build on that, you know, marketization of education comment um, as well, and 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 what is education for, really? You know, it's it is about yes, gaining knowledge and skills without a doubt, but it's also about the cultivation of being and mind, and and that happens in a dialogue with learning about your tools and with learning about um, how to uh, you know uh, develop the process in a sense. But there's also that kind of uh, responsibility that we have. I, I guess in some ways, I think about it as a responsibility as an educator to continually like open the door for, for those who are in your sort of custodianship or, or stewardship at the time that they're with you, because you're 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 hoping to just kind of keep, you know, prodding and and and, and in enabling you know, an inquiring mind to unfold, an inquiring creative mind to unfold. And, and I just wanted to kind of return to one of the questions that was missed there about, you know, what about the schools that are now popping up around the place that, you know, are outside of any kind of formal educational system. I think this is a really interesting movement that's happening, both with anti-university, you have no school in Paris and in France, which I'm partially involved with. You have Mamao in Lisbon, for example. And I think what you're starting to kind of also also see parallel and 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 this you could we could kind of have the question about is this an elitist um a kind of um potential here in a way but you know people are beginning to really kind of go why do i need to spend 10k going to particularly within the uk i'm not speaking so much about the continent of europe right and what they're what they what some people are doing and some people are being encouraged to do is to go just cast out you know you have many many universities giving most of their content now some of the top universities away for free you can do a, a large number of courses at the at, at the top at, at any level that you want to do in a sense and then when it comes down to the art school approach i've noticed by working with my colleagues in france on no school during the summer you have students that are coming from all around the world that want to pay to basically be in an environment for a couple of weeks with who they consider as the top people in their field. And they will travel to do that basically because they want to spend the time and they want to spend that deep level of engagement with people who are extremely, extremely skilled at what they're doing. And that then unfolds into partnerships, alliances, uh, PhD programs, uh, PhD, um, both, sorry, not just only PhD, I want to be clear about that, but all, all levels, undergrad, masters and PhD in a sense. So I think we're seeing quite a, we'll see quite a major shift, particularly within the UK of kind of like uh, a decision perhaps for some not to go to university if it continues at this cost, because we'll end up with the American model where people are in a huge amount of debt and the, and, and the value of it, particularly if we're going to be pumping a particular marketization and a reduction in knowledge of skill sets, you know, which I think is what Steve pointed out in that trajectory is that we're after losing because we haven't got the, the time and the skills resource. So people are going to be buy, buying out into other models. And and I think also where do those, those that, that skills knowledge come from um, in terms of being, you know, aligned to industry that we are updating um, students with the very kind of best of uh, of those skills. Um, I'm just reading here um, uh, from Deb about how how can art schools, especially those as part of bigger institutions, remain agile and responsive in the light of rapid industry shifts and the technological changes when budgets are tight and risk um, perceived to be high. So uh, wh where are those kind of balances between you know, training students to be industry ready uh, against the kind of the cost of you know, software and, and, and technology? Jack. I, I love that question by, by Deb. And I think these are things that we need to really get on the table as well, because this isn't about us having all the answers. These are questions that we are being asked of and ask ourselves. Uh, the, the agility, uh, universities are always risk averse. Uh, you know, the, they, they have to sort of balance their books and they're never, you know, and because of that very 
conservative. Um, I would say that art schools, we like to think of them as these great free big beasts. I, I don't think they are. Um, I think it's a myth. Um, I think it's we, we've got this ideal, sorry to burst the bubble. But I, I, I do think this thing of what I said earlier about the, the, the glass house where people are in and out, that we need to connect differently with industry. I, I, I'm a, a trustee at, 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 at Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool are doing amazing things within incredibly tight budgets. And the big thing that we've been talking about on that board is who are our advocates? We need to get advocates who can speak for us and on behalf of us. We've got hundreds of fantastic success stories as to how the creative arts have been heavily impactful on our economy in a very positive way. And I think we need to reach out to those people and we need to get them to tell our stories uh, and convince that we are worth uh, we are worth the money. We are we do offer a service that is integral to everything that uh, we do within our society. Um, but I don't think that we can just sit back and let it happen. And I don't think that we should be sitting there complaining. I think we need to be very proactive and thinking of best ways forward. And some of the models of the new schools, I mean, I put in ACOL 42 because I actually, I like it and I hate it. I think it's great because you wait to get in, you don't pay any fees, you sit a, a test, it's very equal and fair, and it's it's an opportunity for people at all levels. Um, the problem is it's funded by a business, which some ways there is a bit of a concern that they have an agenda that might not always match with the freedom of uh, education that we want in education. So we're kind of in quite a difficult space. So Deb, great question. Come and work with me on it, because these are things we need to put forward and look at who can start to answer those things for us. And I think our students actually should be informing industry, not just trained for industry, but we do need to not see industry as a dirty word in the art school, because it really isn't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Teresa, a comment, come, come back from you. Yeah, I, I actually was just thinking, I think the word industry ready is a red herring. It's a misnomer, actually. What does it actually mean to be industry ready? Because if in the end of the day, if you think about what is your working life predominantly set up on, it's about relationships, right? Getting on with people, right? Okay, I'm, I, I appreciate that there's a certain level of skill sets that particular industries do require. But the majority of, of what, what does it really mean to be industry ready, in a sense, I think is what we need to sort of question here. And... And that's basically kind of my 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 point, really. I mean, we're it, we're in an age at the moment where deep fakes. I could have sat here literally trained an algorithmic network, fed it a load of my personal images, and sat here and gave this talk essentially. And you may you may not even know that it was actually not me that was here. Okay, so that that's where we're at, people. You know, and then we have kind of climate change collapsing around us as well. So we've got these very, very, very interesting big societal shifts that are happening. So what does industry ready mean? Right. I think we're past that. Past that. That's gone. That's gone. We're not there anymore because industry is moving so fast, so quickly. We cannot prepare our students to be industry ready for anything because that industry, by the time they come out, is going to be radically different. So we need to go back to the basic principles of what is an educational system. You know, it's developing an inquiring, inquisitive mind that is sustainable across a lifetime. And that is not that is that's not just this industry ready, I think, jargon that we have been locked into in some ways. Um, uh, a leftist, he talks about um, uh, creating an experience. The, ex uh, the experience of the art school uh, includes art, music. Um, so it's not just about information. It's a, and it's about that kind of uh, um, uh, 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 about going back to that experience and, and the kind of the networks and the communication that Jack was talking about. Colm uh, says, industry ready means nothing. It's a new labour soundbite. Jack. Come back on that because I didn't use the word ready. I used the word industry. And I think that this is a, it's a really interesting um, debate as to, because I think Deb's point is a really good point. Industry is running away with itself. And what industry needs are creative thinkers, and we know that. And therefore, we aren't—we are not going to have our students industry ready. They're going to be 
interest, industry provocateurs. They're going to be people that will make that change. But I think that we have to have it as part of the discussion. But it's that linking up as to the importance of, I mean, this, this whole series is about the importance of engaging with materials and, and your mind being informed by processes of making things. And that makes you think about very important issues uh, that we're having to deal with now. But I think we have to learn ways to articulate that because we can't just talk to ourselves. If we could talk to ourselves, it'd be great. But the reality is, we have to convince other people. And I think we can do that well. And I think the greatest advocates will be our students. Um, in, uh, Deb says, um, industry is what we're preparing our students for in the context of the subject. Uh, and Suzanne Klein says, maybe industry ready should mean that people stand a chance to do what they are passionate about and do not need stack shelves in supermarkets. I just wanted to go back to um, Jack's um, uh, statement about the, the, the ways of making in the process. And, and, and Christine hinted, um, she alluded to that through the, the, the Peter Blake uh, ways of making of which this, this conference series has kind of been inspired by. Um, and again, back to those sort of that idea of tools and, and materials. So, um, and I think that's, you know, an important training in terms of how, how do we understand about the traditional um, processes that, that Steve was talking about. Um, so uh, Rachel says, is the industry interested in us? Steve. My microphone on. Um, yeah, I think the industry is interested in us completely. Best examples, I think, we can give is Karina and I work for Renishaw, who um, are a really high tech company that make odd equipment that does brain implants and lots of health and medical measuring equipment. But the one thing they were interested in was teaching their engineers to use cardboard and sticky tape and everything to build things creatively because their engineers didn't know how to make stuff apart from using CAD. So what we have is a set of unbelievable skills that we need to get, make sure that industry understand that we have those unbelievable skills and ways of thinking. And actually it's the old interface that we haven't always told our students that you have a set of skills which are very useful to industry. And it isn't necessarily that you want a set of particular skills for a particular project, but it's understanding the fundamentals of those skills, which I keep coming back to. So, um, uh, where are we? Um, back to uh, uh, Teresa. It's great to have this unfolding conversation about what industry prep already. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Sue Gregor, completely agree. Your ex students are ready to stand up for our education. Um, and um, Kim Sutherland, for me, it's about making materials and processes. Oh, it's about thanks, I had other things to say. Oh, I've got the mic. On. Um, so, um, does anyone else uh, want to have any uh, um, any further comment? Steve, you're back. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Technology let me down. So, um, yes, yeah, so we were just talking about that. Uh, Kim Sutherland talk says, for me, it's about making materials and process. It's about thinking through making. So, again, sort of reference to what Christine was, uh, was saying, uh, again, about Peter, Peter Blake. Um, so any, uh, do we have any other questions from, uh, from the audience? This is what happened last time, isn't it? Um, so I think, um, I think we've, we've, we've kind of got to our, um, our, our maxim, I think, here. Uh, and we've, been, we've had such an amazing conversation. And thankfully, it's been recording for all this time. So um, 
Thank you so much to uh, all uh, um, our speakers this evening, and thank you very much for the superb uh, chat uh, in in the in the in the in the chat box. Um, I'm going to um, um, shortly. I'm going to become unpresent. I'm going to come out of present mode. And um, what you are, are very uh, welcome to do is uh, um, is to kind of do some networking and chat around the tables. Um, and as I said, um, the Remo will stay open until um, 6.45. Please do go around uh, and, and talk to people and keep your cameras on and your, and your mic on if you, if you would like to talk to other people. Um, and like Cinderella, 6.45, the Remo conference will kick you out. So please say get your goodbyes. <laughs> Once again, thank you very much to Jack, Stephen, Teresa, and, and Christine for your, your wonderful contribution this evening. Uh, please look out for um, any more, um, for further events. We will have them on the CFPR website. Um, I've got a few requests for further information. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for, uh, for listening. <laughs>